So last week we started considering the question, what's the relationship between the use of language and what things in language mean? As we said, it looks like there's got to be some sort of relationship between the two. It's the fact that we use language that makes it mean something in the first place. But the question is, what aspects of our use of it determine what it means? Because not every single fact about the use of language is important for what it means. So what are the facts about usage that make it mean what it means? This week we're going to be considering an answer, a very important answer given by Paul Grice to this question. Essentially what Grice said is that sentences mean particular things because they tend to be uttered with specific kinds of intentions. When we say things to each other, we intend for each other to react in certain kinds of ways. And for this reason, we could call Grice's theory an intentionalist theory of meaning. It's a theory where sentences mean what they do because they tend to be uttered with certain kinds of intentions. However, as you'll see, the kinds of intentions that are in question are a lot more complicated than you might have thought. It's a lot more complicated than just intending for your audience to believe something or intending for your audience to do something in response to what you say. Because it turns out just simple definitions like those I just mentioned have fairly straightforward counterexamples. So what we're going to do first is we're going to start, as Grice does, between, by making some distinctions. By distinguishing first natural and non-natural meaning, and occasion and timeless meaning. After we do that, our question then will be, how do we define non-natural occasion meaning? And we're going to go through a sequence of possible answers to that question that get more and more complicated as we work up to Grice's own account. We're then going to consider some problems for Grice's account. There's a general question about how to apply it to sentences that are not intended to make people believe things. Here we're thinking of things like imperatives, i.e. orders or questions. There are, and then there are just another kind of class of counterexamples which, if you like the counterexamples, seem to suggest that intending, intending to have a communicative effect of like believing or producing a certain kind of response, it's hard to see how that will happen in every single case or that you'll intend to do that in every single case. Finally, then, we're going to consider a very different kind of counterexample, which comes out of the extra excerpt you read. This excerpt is from a much longer text called Logic and Conversation, and we're actually going to be returning to earlier bits of Logic and Conversation later on this semester when we talk about implicature. But in this excerpt, what Grice is doing is he's exploring adding more conditions to the analysis. So as you'll see, the analysis and meaning is, is relatively complicated. It involves three different conditions. But he entertains adding more more conditions to the analysis. Because, as we'll see, the, the analysis for meaning involves three different kinds of intentions. But there could be cases where you have those intentions, but also intend for your audience to not realize that you have those intentions. These cases get kind of complicated, but they raise interesting questions about what the best version of this account should look like. So that's going to be a plan for today. We're going to go through Grice's distinctions, we're going to go through a series of accounts to get through Grice's account. We're going to cons consider some objections. And then we're lastly, we're going to consider this question about what kind of extra intentions should be added to Grice's account.